Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Coming up on our program, from driverless cars to Donald Trump's meeting with tech luminaries, it's been a big week in the tech world. Also, we'll hear from a Stanford scientist who won a prestigious MacArthur Fellowship for his inventive solutions to global problems. But first, we start with the environment. This week, Governor Jerry Brown spoke at the annual gathering of the American awesome. Geophysical awesome. Union in San Francisco. Are Brown struck a defiant tone, future? vowing to keep you, fighting to tackle say, climate change. We got the scientists, we got the universities, we have the national labs, and we have the political clout and sophistication for the battle. And we will persevere. Have no doubt about that. <clears throat> Scientists from all around the world attended the conference, including the U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change, Jonathan Pershing. KQED science editor Craig Miller spoke with Dr. Pershing about the Trump administration's policies on climate change. Dr. Pershing, thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been about a year now, almost exactly, uh, since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed by almost 200 countries. Can you start by just giving us an update on where that is? So a couple of different things. First off, the agreement was a structured exercise in which countries committed to reduce their emissions. Each country took a different target, a different perspective, had different priorities in their national development policies, but all the countries that signed on agreed. They had to submit a report with what they intended to do. Reports have now been submitted by 186 countries around the world, representing about 99% of global emissions. Each one saying, this is our game plan. This is our game plan. This is what we're going to try to do. And they picked a couple of different years. Some picked 2025, some picked 2030. Uh, they picked numbers of absolute emissions. Some said, we're going to actually work on forests. Brazil made a major push on the forestry side. Other countries, China, India, big proposals on renewable energy. The United States, Europe, absolute emissions cuts. Everyone shows a slightly different structure. Those plans are now in. And in the years since Paris, implementation of the plans has started. And that's been the big move over the last year. Now, against this backdrop, we continue to get mixed signals at best from the incoming Trump administration, uh, from Donald Trump himself. One moment he'll say uh, his mind is open on the Paris Climate Accord. And the next minute he says, uh, nobody knows if climate change is even real. Um, how do you deal with that? Do you have any indication of what this administration will actually do? Not really. I, and I think we have to wait a little bit and see. I, I do, uh, frankly, have my own sense of disappointment about some of the people he's named. He has not picked people so far who have been forward-leaning on this question. Mm -hmm. And to my way of thinking, that's not good for the United States. You're talking about people like Rex Tillerson, for Secretary of State, who's an oil executive from ExxonMobil, uh, Rick Perry, yep, the from, from Secretary from, from Energy, Texas, and, and Mr. Yeah. Pruitt from Oklahoma. These are not guys who are on the uh, pushing for climate policy part of the spectrum, for sure. Interestingly enough, Mr. Tillerson is uh, perhaps the most forward-leaning of the entire group. Oh, uh, he has, since the election, uh, come back and he said we should stay in Paris. Mm -hmm. He said we should actually act on greenhouse gas emissions. It's a problem. He's even called for a carbon tax. So unusually for someone mm -hmm. in that position, he believes it's not only real, but it's a, a problem we have to address. That's not been so much the case for Mr. Pruitt, who has been, in his context, as Attorney General for Oklahoma, suing the Environmental Protection Agency to to get out of the clean power plan, or what Mr. Perry has said, which is that he believes strongly in the continued enhancement of fossil fuels and how those might move forward. So we have a very mixed set of messages coming from the appointments and from the president-elect himself, who has been, frankly, less consistent about what he says. But I think I worry that we want a consistent posture. The issue is clearly real, clearly affecting Americans, clearly affecting security of the nation and globally. And if we don't move fairly quickly, I think we've got a big problem looming. You mentioned the clean power plan. That's basically the Obama administration's game plan. That's kind of the centerpiece of their climate strategy for this country. But it all came from executive authority. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress wouldn't sign off on any of this. So what happens if the Trump administration gets into place and they actually do bail out of Paris or just simply fail to put any actions in place that would make, you know, that would, that would help fulfill the country's obligation? First, the clean power plan is actually partly a reaction to the existing law. The Supreme Court ruled that carbon dioxide's a pollutant. Mm -hmm. Because they've made that ruling, the Clean Power Plan, not the Clean Power, but the Clean Air Act, mm -hmm. requires that EPA take action to regulate those pollutants. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the new administration could come in and say, we don't like this particular choice, but they still have to regulate. A Supreme Court decision is not just an executive order, it's an interpretation of a congressional law that has standing. 
The second thing which I'd noticed is that many states intend to move forward anyway. We're seeing that happen in a host of states. California is moving, New York is moving, Oregon's moving, some states in the Midwest are moving. It is by no means narrowly uh, the two coasts only. You've got a number of other players. And I'd also note that it's not the only big policy. So we've got commitments on, that Congress has passed since we completed Paris, in which they've extended for five years renewable tax credits. There are a series of programs on efficiency standards the Department of Energy has done over the last five years. There are programs, again, that have been approved for automobile efficiency. On the other side, what happens if the U.S. does do that? What's the world going to do? And I think three things. The first one. I think they'll move forward anyway. We've seen very clear indications that the major players intend to move independent of the U.S. elections. China said so, Europe has said so, Mexico has said so, Canada has said so. So we're seeing real action. And it's driven partly, countries very much believe climate change is a problem. And partly, the things they would do have domestic benefits, just as they would for us. So if I take a look at things in the domestic space, there are about two and a half million people who work in clean energy. That's an enormous number. You don't phase those rules out because you've got all these jobs attached to that. And as we develop, there are more jobs coming. So if we think about that structure, very good economic policy. Or you think about a program for vehicle efficiency. Well, that's partly about how much oil you consume. Right. Those are real wins for us, but they're wins for China, which is now a bigger oil, bigger oil importer than the United States is. So for them, it's an economic security question. All of this plays in and I think leads to continued action independent of the U.S. You really think that all of those other, most of those other major emitters around the world, those other countries, will stay the course even if the U.S. bails out of Paris? So I take a look at a country like the United Kingdom, moving out of the U.K. Is it giving up its climate policy? Was it kind of because the EU had pushed it? No, it wasn't. It's enshrined in U.K. law and the new Prime Minister, Prime Minister May, has said, I'm going to do this independent of what's happening. I look at what's going on in India. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, has said, we have several hundred million people who do not have electricity. I have to provide it. How am I going to do that? I actually like renewables. I'm going for solar. That's a big part of the program. And you know what? The access to electricity was not contingent on the U.S. That was contingent on a domestic agenda for movement. The political commitment in these countries, I think, is quite robust. You gave me a good segue for the next question when you talked about states, actually, here in California. Uh, there's a huge commitment, uh, very ambitious climate goals. Um, how much can the tr Trump administration or anybody who's actually in the White House really affect that? I mean, how much could they throw a wrench into the works in terms of California's goals and commitments? Well, listen, I, I think there's a lot of capacity in the federal government to facilitate things or to slow things down. So, for example, we passed and Congress approved uh, the extension of the protection and the investment tax credits for renewables. Part of how California can move forward in meeting its own goals is that there's an economic benefit that comes from these tax credits. Mm -hmm. Supposing the federal government removes that, would California stop? I doubt it. I just spent some time at uh, an incubator in Oakland looking at solar incubating technologies. How do you get new companies in? It's a dynamic place. There's all these people making investments. They've got angel investors on the side waiting to come in. They've got some big commercial vendors coming in to work with them. Very exciting. It's stimulated because there's a good market here. It is abetted and expedited because the feds are in. So it probably slows things down. I don't think it turns things off. Not according to our governor, anyway, Not who, according to the governor. who was uh, defiant yeah. this week in front of a huge gathering of Earth scientists in San Francisco, basically saying to Washington, don't mess with us. Yes. The clock is ticking. I mean, uh, about two thirds of Californians, at least, uh, according to polls, believe that that the impacts of climate change are already happening. They're here. Um, we don't have a lot of time to mess around with this, do we? That's the consensus of the science community. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, we weren't sure what was yet happening, but we knew it was coming. Now we know it's going to be really bad, and we can already see it. And that change, which is relatively recent, is more and more severe. I'm struck by some of the probabilities that people use. So we had earlier uh, in the course of the, uh, of the late fall a series of big floods in Louisiana. The scientists are telling us that it's 40 times more likely that that will happen again because of climate change. We're looking at flooding in New York City, which kind of rises over and gets into the subway system. So in lower Manhattan, you've got 60 feet of water in those subway stations. That's enormously increased because there's already been almost a foot of sea level rise in the New York Harbor. And we're expecting one to three more feet in the next 50 years. How do you think about those questions? You're really looking at risks. 
I was just in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. They're looking at massive expenditures to fight forest fires. Right. Those are increasing because of drought. And here. Droughts tied back and here as well. And the governor investing in options. As you look at Hetch Hetchy and what comes across for the smoke coming in and the air quality and respiratory problems you have in, in San Francisco, much less than the rest of the state. This is part of a climate change phenomenon and it's not in our kids' generation, it's now. Finally, going back to uh, Donald Trump's comment that nobody knows if climate change is real. Um, what do you say to that? I would say that he should take a look at the science. Uh, I myself have been trained in the sciences and I find compelling when I can get all of the academies of science around the world, including Russia, including Europe, including the United States, and I get an AGU meeting in which the polling there suggests that it's a universal, virtually universal consensus, this is real, and I get impacts that play out globally, not just in one line of evidence, but in every line of evidence, I say you can't ignore that. And whether you believe it or not, the risk is sufficiently high that you have to act. We act on things that are much less risky, much less probable, because they matter to Americans. They matter to our future, to our welfare. And in this context, this is a certainty. And if you're not acting on it, I don't think you're serving well the people who elected you. Dr. Pershing, thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here. Now to tech news. On Wednesday, President-elect Donald Trump met with executives of the world's biggest tech companies, including Silicon Valley's Facebook, Apple, and Tesla. They discussed job creation and tax reform. Also this week, ride-hailing innovator Uber rolled out its self-driving cars for customers in San Francisco, but the company hit a roadblock with the California DMV. The agency says the cars are operating illegally. And the fallout continues over allegations that Russia tried to influence the outcome of the presidential race through cyber attacks. Joining me now to discuss these stories are Queena Kim, senior editor of KQED Silicon Valley Desk, and Dai Wakabayashi, tech reporter for The New York Times. Welcome to you both. Thanks. Dai, let's start with Uber. It's based here in San Francisco, made a big splash this week, unrolled its self-driving cars to passengers in the city, mm -hmm. but it didn't last very long, did it? No, it's... Um I mean, you know, they they decided to roll out their autonomous vehicles here. Uh, they've been doing it already in Pittsburgh, and um, you know, it's a pilot program. And the they that you know, I think Uber as a company kind of ascribes this policy that it's better to ask for forgiveness later than beg for permission. And so uh, they why didn't it just get a permit though? I mean, lots of other companies have permits to do this. Uh, you know, Google, Tesla, GM. The permit only costs 150 bucks. Right. I think the, the main thing is they don't want to have to share the data. So if you get the permit and you have to uh, this test permit from the DMV in California, you are um, expected to share the data of crashes, the numbers of human intervention. So if you know your robot car is going somewhere it's not supposed to and a human driver takes over. And I think Uber at this point doesn't want to share uh, that data with its competitors and the general public because you know, it is still pretty early stages. And you know, they made the thoughts? argument that um, I guess that it was technically not an autonomous vehicle because there is somebody behind the driver's wheel to take over at any given time. Um, but I thought it was a great publicity win, wasn't it? Like for the general public, uh, we here in Silicon Valley know that they've made great strides in terms of becoming more of a transportation tech company. But I think in most popular minds, it's still the ride sharing or ride hailing app. And now with this news, even with them being shut down, it's like, oh wow, they've got these autonomous vehicles. They're more of a tech transportation company. And so the publicity coup, I think. Mm. Could, could it be part of a larger strategy because this is not the first time Uber has flaunted rules and it often does so seeming to want to generate enough consumer interest so that uh, that excitement can get politicians to pass laws more favorable to Uber. It, it did kind of shoot itself in the foot a little bit though because I don't know if you guys saw the YouTube video of one of the Uber cars mm -hmm. going through a red light um, in a pedestrian crossing. The self-driving uh, Uber car. The self-driving Uber car and Uber later said that it was the human driver that um, ran that red light. So it does seem strange to me that, you know, in a, in a situation where um, the human is there to help, I guess, the robot not make mistakes, it's the human that made the <laughs> mistake there. But, you know, um, over time, it'll make driving safer. 
but you know, I do worry about what happens if there is a major crash. Or what about worries about um, cybersecurity? I mean, how, what's the possibility of someone hacking and taking over these cars? Earlier this year, the FBI and the National Institute of Highway Safety uh, issued a warning saying this is something we need to be careful of in terms of hacking cars. And then I'm sure you guys have both heard about the stuff that's been on TV of people who have been able to hack these cars, not just um, the car itself, you know, anything that's connected to the internet can be hacked. Mm -hmm. But there was even an interesting example out of UCSD where it was a dongle that insurance companies put into the car. So this was, you know, separate device um, to uh, some sort of test with the insurance company. And someone's able to hack that device and get into the car. So yeah, it's definitely a concern. And in terms of shooting itself in the foot, I have heard this, I don't know if you have, but there's been a little bit of a tiny debate about Uber going out so aggressively like this because obviously when new technologies come on, people are often very weary of them. And so it seems like uh, the word is that Google's taking a little bit more of a cautious approach until they're at 100 or 99 percent and it doesn't mess up, it will inspire consumer confidence. But obviously something like this, people are like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Well, also on the, top, uh, on the topic of cybersecurity, let's also talk about the CIA's findings uh, about the cyber attack on the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. Dai, is there anything that can be done against Russia at this point in response? I don't think so because it's, you know, the reality is with cybersecurity is that it's really hard to prove without, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt um, that someone did did what they, you know, are accused of. It's, um, it is more art than science to, to kind of pin down the, the culprits for these kind of things. And while there's an overwhelming amount of uh, indicators that seems that Russia is at heart, if they deny it, um, and certainly our president-elect uh, seems to deny it, there's really very little proof that can be done to, I think, you know, um, bring them to account. Well, what does this do for the uh, confirmation hearing for Rex Tillerson, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, choice for Secretary of State? Many Republicans have said that they want a thorough investigation of Russia's role. If Tillerson doesn't come out and acknowledge uh, Russia's interference, does he then risk losing the votes of some of those Republicans? I, I just can't imagine he's going to come out and, um, and condemn Russia for, for this because, um, you know, it's just there's... They can, um, there's, a, there's a plausible deniability, I think, for, and you cannot prove with beyond, you know, a, a shadow of a doubt that, you know, Russia was behind it. And so as long as you can kind of keep denying it and then also that Russia, you know, holds the line, I don't think you can. And so, but what I do think um, will be the challenge for Mr. Tillerson will be to, to show that he's not beholden to Russia, mm -hmm. you know, and so there will be a kind of a tight, tightrope that he's going to have to walk of saying, showing that he can be independent, that he can crack down on Russia if, if it's called for, but not necessarily pin, you know, the, the, the hacking on them. I think. And some already are kind of questioning that given his seemingly friendly relations with Putin. Exactly. Let's move on to the other big tech story that made headlines this week, and that is President-elect elect Trump's meeting with the top tech leaders uh, in the nation, including the heads of Amazon, Tesla, Apple, uh, Facebook. Quina, how much turmoil did that cause in Silicon Valley? Well, as you know, Silicon Valley came out very hard against uh, Trump during the campaign. Um, letters were signed, uh, statements were made, um, and I think there was, uh, within Silicon Valley, there seemed to be a sort of moral angst that these folks were going to meet with Trump at his tower. Uh, some folks had said maybe they should have waited for him to become president rather than giving him this publicity op, waiting for him to become president, going to the White House and meeting with him there. But what I found interesting, and I'd love to get your guys' take on this, is um, that there was this feeling that, you know, the tech leaders, Apple's, Tim Cook, Sheryl uh, uh, Sandberg of Facebook, should have come out and, like, you know, made the morality of Silicon Valley known to Trump, stick up for immigration and, you know, sort of uh, make it known to him that they don't agree with his stands. And I, I, it was sort of interesting that that, it was just sort of, um, to me, it was interesting because it was like that marketing hype is so, um, so strong mm -hmm. that people really expected these companies, which are among the biggest in the country in terms of market cap to somehow and, act differently than any other. And who have other. often, and who have, and companies have, have often said they're working for the common good, but I think they were in, in, in a tight spot. I wanted to ask you also about um, 
the idea of a Muslim database. I mean, these are companies where even some of their own engineers and tech workers have signed a statement saying they will not participate in the creation of such a database uh, that could be used to target Muslims. Mr. Trump has not ruled out that idea. What's the potential here for this to become a really sensitive issue for tech companies to navigate down the line? I think it's a hugely sensitive issue. You know, I think, and you know, as Queen said, that they espouse these values, right, of kind of openness and um, um, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. But you know, there comes a time where you have to walk the walk, um, and so I think it will be very difficult to. Um, do that, and I, you know, Facebook has come out and said that they will not participate in that. Um, they were kind of pressured to do so um, because of a little bit of a PR snafu. But you know, I think it is, it, it does, it is going to come to a point where we're going to have to see where the rubber meets the road about a lot of these companies and 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 the values they espouse versus what they do. And mm. the reality is, I think it's a little naive to think, though, that these companies won't act in their best interests. And so they, these executives all have the fiduciary duty to their shareholders. Yeah. And if the president-elect wants to meet you, I think you got to go. Died this week, President-elect Donald Trump uh, named Travis Kalanick of Uber and Elon Musk of Tesla to his business advisory council. Will they be able to, to protect the industry's goals and uh, interests with a president-elect who was often hostile to tech during the election? I think, I think they will be. And, and the reality is what we've seen from the president-elect is that he's... Um, you know, he's, he speaks in a way sometimes that suits uh, the more of a campaign style. And I think that at the end of the day, Tesla and Uber are both extremely popular among their consumers. And so I think that, you know, they will have quite a bit of sway on that council. Okay. On that note, we will thank you both. Dai Wakabayashi with The New York Times and Queena Kim with KQED. Thank you. Thank you. Turning now to the world of science, this September, Stanford University professor Manu Prakash was one of four Bay Area people to be awarded a prestigious Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation. He was recognized, among other things, for creating a microscope out of paper that costs less than a dollar to make. Physical biologist and inventor Manu Prakash joins me now. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, congratulations to you. <laughs> do you feel anything different? Are you doing anything differently now that you're officially a MacArthur genius? <laughs> I don't know about the, the genius, uh, but uh, I'm really humbled uh, to be recognized this way in my scientific career. Uh, I'm very thrilled and excited, and I think uh, there is a lot more work to be done, so I'm just putting my head down and getting stuff done. Well, your research falls into the field of physical biology. What is that exactly? Um, so I'm a physicist by training, but I think a lot about biological problems very broadly. So I bring uh, new sets of tool sets from the field of physics into biology. All of life forms around on this planet still obey laws of physics. So in the end, uh, physical biology is a lens into uh, biology, but from a physicist's eye. And in fact, when you were in the field, one of the limitations you noticed was the ability to, to view things on mm -hmm. site because mm -hmm. you need a microscope to view a lot of very, very tiny things. So you mm -hmm. created, you've created a lot of fascinating products and concepts, but you're perhaps best known for what's called the Foldscope mm -hmm. microscope. When you brought it here, tell us I about did. it. I <laughs> did. Um, so Foldscope is an origami microscope that you fold together from a flat sheet of paper. It takes a couple of minutes to fold. And this is how it comes, right? In just a sheet of paper, you pop it out, you pop little you cards, you put them together, you assemble them. So this is the finished fold scope. You hold it with your two hands, you move around, and then you focus with your thumbs. Mm -hmm. You can take any traditional glass slide, for example, and insert it in a, a fold scope. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bug that I just caught <laughs> right here <laughs> on your table, and I insert it and we'll be able to actually watch it live. Uh, you hold it with both hands, and this is panning, so now I'm moving around, kind of like walking in a city, except it's a microscopic city. And then the focus is just the tension in my hand. And what that does is generates a little flexure that allows me to move the lenses up and down. Oh, so I'm see. gonna pass this, you hold here and okay. here, and just take a look. And then to focus it. Oh, is that the bug I'm seeing? That is the bug that you're seeing. Okay. You see the little legs? Um, yes, got a little it squashed. looks really gross uh, close <laughs> up now that it's been magnified 140 times. That's correct. <laughs> and what you're looking at are the mouth parts, right there are the mandibles. 
We can tell it's an insect. It's got six legs right there. You see the little mechanosensitive hairs. Wow, and it costs just about 55 cents to make? That's correct, yeah. That's it took amazing. a long time for us to really squeeze the cost down in manufacturing and come up with uh, new ways of thinking about optics to be able to do that. I grew up in India, so I know and understand what it means not to have access, and especially not to have access to science. So it was very important from the beginning that we ask this question much more broadly. And frankly, if you look at all the challenges that we face, you know, be it climate change, environmental challenges, biodiversity, diseases, we need to engage a much broader group of community, not just scientists, in the discourse of science. My primary force when I'm thinking about these sets of tools is I'm just waiting uh, for these ideas to pop in from around the world and people getting connected to each other. Because the tool is exactly the same, when I do an experiment here or when a kid does an experiment in Namibia, another kid in Kansas and another kid in Boston will actually be able to replicate that experiment with the same tool. So everybody builds on top of each other. Were you always like this? Were you, have you always been tinkering? Have you always been passionate about science? Uh, I think I don't know a world other than science. Uh, <laughs> this is how I grew up. Uh, and at that same time, that tinkering has a lot of value personally to me because it allows me to express myself. Uh, but I do very strongly believe uh, tinkering has value for everybody else. You know, when we talk about science education, and the challenges we face, only if we accepted the idea that you're allowed to tinker, I think it'll make a big difference. What's the next big problem you're working on solving? <laughs> I think there are a lot of big problems. One that I've been focusing quite a lot on is uh, figure out how to track mosquitoes out in the field. We've mm -hmm. been building new tools uh, to do mosquito surveillance where citizens can engage. Is that to help cut down on malaria? Or? It helped cut down malaria, Zika, chikungunya, dengue, many different diseases that are carried by mosquitoes but empowering citizens to actually engage in the process of understanding what mosquitoes do when we're not watching. Manu Prakash, recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, thank you for being here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. And if you'd like to get one of those microscopes for a classroom near you, you can go to foldscope.com. And next week, join us for a special look back at some of our top art stories. For more of our coverage, go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tweebu. Thanks so much for watching.